Okay, we are live. So I'll just do a quick intro. So we're live on our 81st installment of Nance and Office Hours. Today I have Waki Chena, who's the community manager and head of business development for X2Y2. It's very, very exciting. So we're going to be going through the origin and development of X2Y2, uh, as well as like the development of NFTs in general. Um, and then as well as this, we're going to have a look at some of the tools that like you can use on Nansen, because hopefully we'll have some X2Y2 uh, viewers as well who maybe don't know anything about Nansen. So we can display us and display X2Y2. Uh, so yeah, if you want to see more videos like this, each week we do like a Nansen and chill. We go through new features, answer questions from the chat. So drop your questions in the chat. Uh, and we have on some really good guests like we do have this week. Uh, and yeah, we try and look at like how to deal with the kind of market that we're in and share some alpha leaks and how to use our product in the best way. So make sure that you subscribe, turn your notifications on uh, so that you don't miss anything in the future. And if you'd like to try Nansen, you can use the link below to sign up for Nansen Lite for free. We also should have a link below uh, to sign up to our seven-day trial. I think it's $9. Uh, that gives you like a standard uh, standard subscription for one week. I think it's really worth it. So yeah, if you want to do that, give it a go. Uh, so the obvious question that you know I'm going to ask you <laughs> is uh, what is X2Y2 for the people that don't know? Uh, and I'm going to integrate into that. Why is it called X2Y2? Yeah, oh, well, thanks for having me. Um, well, what is X2Y2? Well, look, you know, very similar to what OpenSea does. It's basically an NFT marketplace, which allows you to buy and sell all your NFTs. Um, so you can just come here, you know, buy all those sort of crazy degen collections that are minting every day, bring them onto X2Y2. You can have all your listings there and uh, you basically are able to just sell them for either ETH or accept offers very similar to what OpenSea does. Now, one of the differences with uh, what OpenSea or some of the other competitors are doing is that we actually have our own token, which allows users to collect 100% uh, of the daily fees. So effectively, 100% of the daily fees that we collect from the daily trading volume, we redistribute those to all the uh, token users, token owners that are staking those tokens with us. So that's sort of one of the big distinctions between, between the platforms. Um, you were asking what, why is it called X2Y2? Well, I think the, the way, the way it worked is that the, when the founding team was, was working on creating the platform, they were basically looking at it from, um, a, an ecosystem. So if you can imagine an NFT marketplace really is at the center of the NFT ecosystem, where you've got the buyers, the traders, the NFT analytics tools, you've got a whole, you know, a whole set of players that are and market participants. And effectively, when you started looking at it, it created this, this circle, which was really sort of a virtuous, virtuous circle where, you know, in, really in the essence of web three, the idea is you have market participants, they help you generate a product they help you grow and then with web3 we want to redistribute again we want to regenerate you know redistribute those proceeds back to the user so it really created a, a circle so when we when they were looking at a name to create they say well you know why not just call it uh, a circle obviously circle was taken it's not exactly a great name and since there are a bunch of a uh, bunch of tech uh, tech people working on this they just came out with x2y2 which is the equation for how to calculate a circle so that's that's mm. where it comes from Okay, that's very interesting. So how long was like X2Y2 in the works? That's what I've always wondered. So I remember like start of this year, even all of last year, OpenSea had the monopoly on everything. Uh, were you looking at that like before Looks Rare, for instance, or was it like, because clearly OpenSea has, has an issue of not really feeling like it is web free. There's no distribution to uh, users. And I think everyone can spot that there is, there was an opportunity to come in and do something. So how long were you like on the sidelines, maybe building it? Or was it something that you were like, let's just try it and it, like it moved quickly? Right. So it definitely didn't happen over time, uh, overnight. Yeah. It was something that was in the works and it was probably at least six months in the works before, before it came out. Um, 
the the actual dev teams have the team have worked on other marketplaces before on other chains so they already had the experience of creating an nft marketplace but they realized that obviously there was a big gap on on the eth side and then decided to create something with eth now having said that you mentioned looks i think looks was potentially a catalyst to say you know i think that the team behind it are probably a team of very perfection a lot of perfectionists they like to come out and do something very good and release the product on a very good fashion now there's always the saying you know perfect is the enemy of good where you could always keep on building and building until you try to reach perfect but then it, it may never get there so i think when january happened and and looks came out there was a little bit of a catalyst to be like okay we're there we have a product it's already ready let's let's just release it good to go and then we'll obviously keep on increasing it and, and developing it as we go so Mm -hmm. Mid February is when the launch uh, the launch happened, and uh, and since then it's been a, a bit of a road and a, a bit of a, a challenge, but uh, you know it's it's been good. It's, it's been exciting. Mm -hmm. I think we'll get onto that obviously, but I think it's what I actually like, attracts me to like this whole web free space, and I think Nansen is quite similar in terms of like we don't kind of wait around uh, in web free. Kind of if you want to go and get something done, you kind of do it, uh, and then. Hopefully it's still good, but you kind of fix problems yeah. uh, along the way. Uh, there's not this kind of <clears throat> like waiting, sitting on the sidelines, is there? There's innovation. I think all of us kind of chase after that. Um, so you mentioned I, that. I, I think you, you, sorry, I was just about to say, I think you're right. It's one of the big differences. I mean, I used to be in my previous Web2 life, I was working for a fintech mm -hmm. company and I used to be in a startup. It was the startup. It was great, you know, going over to clients and they had some questions and they had some needs and they say, look, I'd like to be able to do this. I would go back to the dev team and tell them, this is what the client wants. This is how to implement it. Let's go and do it. And literally within a few weeks, we would have it there readily available. We ended up then being acquired by one of the big S&P 500 companies. And effectively what happened is that all the bureaucracy and the technology behind it was, you know, came into place. And then you had to go through scrums and agile development and all that stuff which effectively isn't as agile as it should be so we were taking weeks and months to release stuff and then all the good dynamism that we had just got lost and as you rightly say web3 is really back to this and which is why it's moving so fast you know it's it's been great to see how quickly the space is moving and i mean literally if you don't follow within a week something new has come up so it's it's really really cool from that perspective mm -hmm. i think that's a good point as well to not only shill, because I know you'll probably be hiring as well, but if people do want to work in Web3, I think that was such an attractive point for me, like where, uh, joining Nansen uh, is like the responsibility that you get in this space um, and also the freedom that you have. Like you mentioned, you can move quickly, you can try out different things and it just makes it a lot more exciting. Like you said, I have friends that work in like TradFi uh, and it's a lot more boring, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... Uh... Yeah, do you know that we're past the 90s, the, 90, the good time of TriFi is a little bit past now, so. Yes, <laughs> uh, I agree. Okay, so I think we're going to have a look at first, um, actually what we should do first is have a look at the website, because people may not even know what it looks like, they might not have used it. I feel like everyone probably has, but you never know. Uh, so actually, so, so let's let's go back to the front page like, be before showing okay. the Let's just go back to the front page like this, people, everybody cool. sees what it looks like when you first come in. If you go back and click X to Y2 on the top left, yeah. yeah. This will be your, you know, your welcome page when you come in, type uh, X to Y2.io, and then obviously try and follow official links either from our Discord or from our Twitter account. But this is what the, the welcome page looks like. And as you can see, we effectively have a few sections, but three of the main sections is, is one that slideshow that you see there on the right, which shows all the sort of upcoming collections that you know, we're featuring, that, uh, that we're working with, that uh, are sort of potentially hot trending uh, collections uh, up and coming. The second aspect there, which is right there in the middle of the page, is, as you say, sales, volumes, estimated APY, and then the fee uh, in ETH. Basically, what this tells you, this is all within the last 24 hours. So those are obviously all the sales and, and the volume that has happened. The estimated APY is obviously the corresponding fees that we have collected, converted as an APY. So 
Right now, within the last 24 hours, uh, we've already collected 46 ETH worth of fees. And then really, depending on the calculations, you see sort of drastic jumps. So sometimes it goes from, you know, 40 to 80 and then 80 to, to, to 100. Um, but this is sort of updated continuously. And this number there is effectively the number that gets distributed, sorry, on, on the fees there, um, is the number of ETH that gets distributed pro rata to the stakers at the end of each day in the equivalent of X to Y2 tokens. Now, if you scroll a little bit further down, you've got the features projects. Those are potentially more established projects that we are partnering with and um, that we're working with more closely. So we're featuring them, uh, them there. And then obviously you have the hot collections, um, which we are then showing further, further down the road. Now, the good thing, what I personally like is the fact that we are showing not just the X to Y2 numbers, but the OpenSea and the LuxRare numbers so that people are able to really compare and see the difference in volumes and trends between the three platforms. Okay, so I thought, I think uh, you were telling me earlier, if we have a look at, oh, hang on a second. If we have a look at X to Y2. Yep. And then you said to filter by seven days and by volume. We can kind of have, have a look at what kind of collections at the moment are very popular. Uh, yeah. So I think as we all know, we have this Saudis project, uh, which has been doing well. Um, yeah, do you have any... If you look, they've got a thousand, because right now we say it's volume, but they've got a thousand sales, you know, a thousand uh, K worth of sales. It's, sorry, let, let me go back there. Oh, no, average price. That might be... Um, I don't know. Well, I have to look. I'll have to dig into this um, because it only show no average price is one. Okay, no, that was that was right actually. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, they they've been doing extremely well. Um, you know that that, that collection often came out, and it's just so funny. I got to tell you, the projects that are coming out in this bear market, it's uh, to, from 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 a certain aspect, it does make the bear market interesting. Um, I yeah. do have to say, I mean, goblins are the ones that first started the trend. And it really looked like they were waiting, they were planning for this to be really timed with when the bear markets would come out. And they just executed mm -hmm. it geniusly. And, and we've actually seen a pump from them over the past couple of days. But uh, now it's been, it's been fun to see the, everything coming out in the bear market. So I guess what I was mentioning to, to mm -hmm. you there is, was part of maybe something we'll touch on later, is just the fact that we have quite a lot of sales that are happening with the very famous collections, such as the Board Ape Yacht Club, the Mutant Ape Yacht Club, mm -hmm. Other Side, um, Clone X, Doodle. So we have a lot of those big uh, blue chip collections that are happening there. And that this is where people are benefiting from the 0.5% platform fees that we have versus the 25 that some of the competition has. And, you know, when you have a sale that where your average floor price is in the tens of twenties worth of ETH, then, you know, it's an extra few ETH in your pocket and it just makes a lot of sense to use, to use X Y2 from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, if we have a look at uh, Nansen data now, so also while I remember, I completely forgot I, for this episode, we're doing an NFT special. So, I'm wearing, look, if can we see? Oh, wait, it's right behind that. Oh, you have the pudgy, pudgy penguin and you've got it right behind you as well. Yeah, and you've got all behind me. It's the <laughs> best collection, so go and buy that. Uh, okay, so let's have a look. A little pudgy uh, shell on the way. <laughs> let's have a look at Nansen data. And I think it's good that you mentioned that, so we'll come back to it. But I, I do notice, and I'll show in a second, but a lot of like the big purchases nowadays are on X2, Y2, um, because why wouldn't you? I think we had a conversation about it before. Like it's the rational decision to go with like a low fee um, marketplace where you also then rewarded uh, for your purchases. So it kind of makes a lot of sense. And I think we'll also go over later on like why the market is, is irrational. <laughs> and well, yeah, you, you, I, I like how you say it is a rational decision. However, we're not necessarily operating in, you know, always yeah. a rational market. So yeah, we can touch base on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start though, by just looking at kind of the market in general recently. So at the moment, we're just on Nansen under trends and indexes. Uh, we're, we've got all marketplaces shown here, but we'll, we'll also look at X2Y2 in a second. So here you can see we had this big run up and as we all know past kind of may even um nfts were actually doing quite well compared to the market in may but since then uh, have seen big drops 
off in volume. And we're kind of settled now uh, around here, which is what's just under 150K, 100K-ish uh, each week. Uh, <clears throat> and I think what's interesting, and like we'll look at it specifically for X2Y2 is the volume is down, um, but the number of users isn't down that drastically. And in fact, like transactions are kind of as high as they were back in February um, and mid-May, uh, or late May, sorry, early June. Number of transactions, so, right, okay. Yeah, so transactions are high, users are high. Why is volume so low? Uh, and then if you know and have been around uh, during these kind of time periods, I think you will understand why it's because there's been a lot of like low price uh, NFT trades and a lot of just free mints um, or flipping those free mints around the kind of one ETH range uh, or lower. Um, so I think yeah, the, the, what's the really interesting... Mint. The, the Freemans have become huge right now, obviously. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's, and I've, I was just looking at a collection. I was just talking with the collection creator. His name is Eski, and mm -hmm. he just came out with Wagme uh, Unite. No, it's not Wagme United, it's Wagme Army. And, um, and it, it was exactly this. It was just a free mint. But then he did very well because the whole thing sold out. And then since then, it's just been churning and churning and it's been trading. So it, it's the way forward. And then you look at some other collections which we were talking with that are technically well-known, well-respected, that came out with some of their new collections and they haven't sold out, even though they're just trying to mint at 0 0.1. So it, it's really tough at the moment. Um, it, it's a very tough moment for quality collection creators, I would say, because there's still so much competition from, well, there's now so much competition from the free mints that the really good quality projects are probably struggling to mint out, even though they are actually trying to build something something good and, and something in the, for the long run. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a tricky spot. I think I mentioned it like a couple episodes ago. That like at the moment, if you go for something that isn't a free mint, um, one, like you're then fighting against the trend, like you just mentioned. Yeah. And also, I think it can come across like when everyone's losing money and then you try and push out like something that costs a relatively large amount or something like that, uh, it can feel like a cash grab. So I remember there was this um, collection called like Lonely Pop. You probably know it, obviously, mm -hmm. or a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it had like a lot of hype. Um, but at the time, free mints were doing amazing. And I think they put their mint price at like 0 0.2. And it didn't wow. sell like barely anything. All this hype, yeah. but no one was interested, even at 0 0.2. So I think it's a really tough situation because Can you, you might have been building this whole time to get your collection out. And then now you've realized like it has it's, to be free. It's so tough. And can you imagine if you look back at where we were a few weeks ago? I mean, now it's probably two, you know, two and a half months ago, but 0 0.2 ETH now is only $200. Whereas 0 0.2 ETH a few weeks back was you know, a serious amount of money. So it's, it's just crazy that you can't mint out for $200 anymore. But that's the nature yeah. of the cycle. And, and it's probably not a bad thing what we're going through. So we can touch base on it yeah. later. But it will filter out a lot of the crap projects and leave out a lot of the good quality stuff for the next bull run. So I think it's good. Hmm. I think it's actually interesting. Maybe it's like a sign, again, of the kind of irrational market. Because it, even at 0 0.2, like it's $200. I know it's more than obviously free, um, but it's not that bad. But I think we get mm. such habits in crypto uh, and NFTs that they become really hard to break. So if we know that every mint nowadays seems to be free, you then see a price tag on it. I feel like people are put off, even if it's relatively small amount. And I think that relates again to like, if we, we might as well talk about it now, in terms of like X2, Y2, why is there not like the whole movement from kind of open sea over to X2Y2 and looks rare? Because it's rational to do so. You get value back, your fees are lower, and, and that's especially true for you. Um, so I, I did a tweet a while back on it, and it was kind of like, what is the reason? Like, there must just be kind of habit uh, because of it. So what do you think it is? I think habit is, is a large part of it. Um, there's no question about it. Um, you know, we do have to give credit to OpenSea where it's due. They have been there. They, they started the pace, the, the, the space. You know, we can't, we can't uh, ding on OpenSea all the time. If it wasn't for OpenSea, we, the NFT space wouldn't be where it, is, where it is now. Now, having said this, obviously, there are downsides to using the platform. And this is the reason why there, there was space for 
uh, competition to, to be built. Now, considering how long they have been up there and considering the fact that most collections are used to listing their official collection with giving the open sea link then i think by definition it, it's ingrained in people's mind that this is the first place to go to and unless you've been in the space for a while unless you're really out here trying to make money which is technically what everybody is is trying to do you know yes you have the collectors that love the art and love all of this but i think that's probably the some of the minority of all the all the users that are out there so it, it would make sense but it, it's just a, ha a hard thing to break um you know think about something that you do you've done for 20 years or 30 years and that you're trying to break that habit it just takes a long time and i think that's where we are at the moment now you were talking about rational versus irrational behavior um the rational behavior is should indeed be to list on on the cheapest um on the platform with the cheapest fees now if for some reason you believe that there is potentially more liquidity on the other platform. Fine, fair enough. But at least list on both platforms to give yourself a chance. Because nowadays, um, we were discussing this earlier, but nowadays, a lot of the sales are happening through aggregators, right? So the aggregators, they will show you both listing. They will show you the listing on OpenSea with the higher fees and on X to Y2 with the lower fees. So it gives at least people a chance to get their items sold on x 2 y to where they will save the fees. So this is sort of what I'm trying to also educate people. I'm not telling them don't list on OpenSea, right? Because obviously you do want to benefit from that liquidity potentially. But at least give yourself a chance, list on both platforms, especially now that the gas fees are pretty low. It really doesn't cost much to do that. You know, mm -hmm. do at least both. Also, we do have something which a lot of people don't necessarily know, which is called a private sale function, where let's imagine I had a relatively high priced item to sell and I knew that you were interested and you tell me, you know what, I'm, I'm happy, I'm, let's sell on the price, let's go and purchase it from you. You and I could go and effectively buy and sell directly on X to Y to through a private sale and then you wouldn't, well, if you were selling it to me, you wouldn't have to pay any fees because we're doing a private transaction. So there are quite a lot of benefits of, of using X2Y2. It's just that people, not everybody has heard it and not everybody's used to using it. So that's obviously what I've been working on is working on with collection creators, market participants, just to remind people that A, there's an alternative and B, there are lower fees. So try it out and at least give it a chance. Mm -hmm. I think... Um... I want to make a point on that, especially for like aggregators. But if we have a look here, so this was kind of the data that I used for the tweet. Um, it only compares between looks rare and OpenSea, so not including X to Y to. But you can see the dominance of OpenSea, like That's even of recent times, it's like 1% um, being used by like smart money. And then also, I think, oh, we don't have it. We used to have, oh no, here we go, power users. Um, as well, like 99% of power users are using OpenSea. So there's clearly like such a strong habit because like we've just mentioned over and over, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, I think for me personally as well, like when I see a collection, so recently we had those eggs, I remember first thing you do, like, or first thing I wanted to do was go on OpenSea and have a look at them. And then I'm like, what, what am I doing? So yeah, like, already that shows the habit. So then I go on to Gem. Uh, and like I exclusively use Gem now to buy mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Um, and if I see X2Y2 on there, if I see Looks Rare, those are the ones that I go for. And not even just because you're the guest, I will go for X2Y2 um, because like the low fees, it just makes sense. Yeah. So, and I think we're moving to like an aggregator market where everyone will just use aggregators. I think Gem, Genie, obviously they're uh, part of Uniswap now as well. But I think mm -hmm. those will be the main things. And then you also mentioned um, about listings, like why don't you list on x 2 y as well as OpenSea? I'm not even sure that people are completely aware that you can do that on Gem. So you can list on all marketplaces on there as well. So maybe there's just like a not communicated properly or not communicated enough of the options because I feel like people just have in their head NFT associated with OpenSea. So maybe there's a gap. 100%. Yeah. There is, I mean, 
you know, I remember my early days of NFTs. There isn't a guide, there isn't a handbook that you can go and check to see like, what can you do? What can you not do? And considering that, you know, you're getting crypto, you know, your own keys, you manage your own money. All you're worried about is that, shoot, what if I do something wrong? I could get hacked. I could lose all my NFTs. I could lose all my ETH. So th there is also that aspect of if you're not using it all the time, that you don't want to deviate from what you know. If you've done something and it's worked, you're thinking, okay, fine. You know what? Let's just, let me just stick to this and not worry about it because you may not be using it every day. So th there is a large aspect of education that needs to be done where exactly, as you say, we have had those questions where people come into Discord and be like, hey, can I list on multiple platforms? We're like, yeah, of course, there's, you, know, you can do just the same way you can list your item on eBay and you can list your item on Amazon. It's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, so you're right. There's, there's that aspect where people don't necessarily know what they can and cannot do. And as you say, the functionalities that are available. And on top of this, the fact that Gem allows this functionality right there so that you can just do it in one go is just fantastic. And um, it, it's changing. Uh, we can definitely see that slowly but surely the behavior is changing. Um, I don't know what you're looking at volume right now, but I, I tend to lo also look at the number of users that we've been uh, having over the, over, the, over the few weeks and over the month. And our number of users has been drastically rising over the weeks. And that is also a testament that people are, as they are educating themselves and as they are getting to know, as they do getting to know more about the NFT space, then they say, okay, right, I've heard of this X2Y2, let me try it, let me list them. I was showing you, you were showing earlier the number of transactions that have happened. So it's not even a problem of security or safety because clearly there are so many very famous uh, transactions and collections that are listing there and sales that are happening for quite a lot of ETH. At the time when other deed was, uh, was hot and coming, we had, I think to this day, I think we probably still have the highest other deed land sale, which happened on X2Y2 which was from nobody vault or no, nobody ETH or whatever it was. Yeah. And he sold it from a ridiculous amount of ETH, but he, he obviously was selling on X to Y2 because of the huge amount of fees that was, that they were saving him. So, you know, the people that are selling those big ticket items are using it. So it, it can't be a safety issue. It's just, it's just an education and habit aspect. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you as well. So I did a Twitter space with Jeannie, like, couple of months ago now i don't know what happens to time it might have been like <laughs> a week ago at this point but yeah, i think it was like a couple of months ago and how um much communication do you have with these aggregators because i thought it was really interesting from them how much communication they had at the time with like OpenSea. so they said very often they talked to them the relationship was like very strong so as we look here like gem takes up uh well it uses the majority of your users, that didn't make any sense. <laughs> Most of your users use Gem to use X2Y2, like even more than directly on your website. So clearly so, there needs to be some kind of communication. So yeah, how was your relationship so, with that? So that's interesting. I didn't realize the, um, that line was used when we looked at it uh, earlier. So mm. you've got 10,000 people that are using Gem and that are, are those X2Y2 sales then? Yeah, so these are, Okay. People that are using X to Y to through Gem, basically. Shoot. So we've actually got quite a lot more users than I thought, technically, from that perspective, although they are yeah. technically <laughs> Gem users. But, um, but yeah, you're right. A, a lot of the sales are happening through Gem. You were asking how uh, much communication we have with them. Well, a, a lot in the sense that, obviously, I think part of the success of the platform is our relationship with the partners that we're working with and the fact that we've integrated the API. So we've done a lot of work building a very good, strong, solid API that can be integrated by all sorts of tools and all sorts of platforms. Obviously, the aggregators being one of them. Um, they, we are in, in conversation with them because obviously it's in our interest for, for the listings to show up there correctly. Obviously, they have been going through their own uh, changes internally, where obviously they got bought by, by OpenSea, and they've had a few things that are changing. But we, we are working closely with them because, again, you know, even though they have been bought by OpenSea, the Vasa at, uh, at Gem, it really, we had an AMA with him. We had a couple AMAs with him. And you can see that he is 
actually trying to do something good for the space. He is trying to, he, he is a, a builder uh, in, the, in the true sense of the term. He wants to go and develop and build cool tools. Um, and he was actually saying that in a way that is right becoming a means to an end because he was saying he wants to do a bit more things like Elon Musk does and maybe he has other visions. Really? To do to do other <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was saying he's got ideas to do other things in life after that. So, um, but yeah, no, no, we are in conversation with them. We also, we need to actually have a chat with Jeannie to see um, how we could do, work uh, with them more, even more closely. But uh, yeah, no, no, we're talking with them all the time. Mm. Yeah, I think people at Nansen completely rave about him as well as being like really, really smart guy and also very genuine, like you said, uh, person. Uh, so, yeah, I have always had a really good experience with Jim, I have to say. Uh, I think it's great that we have aggregators because I don't like the open sea monopoly either, uh, which yeah. is also why I like the whole kind of uh, new chains popping up with so like Solana NFTs and everything like that. And I should say that we do have Solana NFT data. Uh, but yeah, oh, other chains. Interesting. I mean, that's yeah, a hot topic chains, as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Recently, um, Solana NFTs have been quite uh, popular. Uh, we could go over all of that, but we don't want to do I that. I mean, <laughs> you look, I mean, just, just to touch base on this, yeah. you look at the amount of volume that Magic Eden is generating. Yeah, yeah. It's massive. It's almost just as big as OpenSea someday. So it's uh, definitely the, the new hot chain for, for NFTs. Mm. And I think, like, as Solana gets bigger, I'm pretty sure they will also get uh, a lot bigger over time. So oh, yeah. let's go back to where we were supposed to be looking at the start <laughs> okay. of, like, volume just for X2, Y2. So I thought it was really interesting. Uh, hopefully we can see here. Um, even, like, back in March, the volume was, like, quite low. So we have a wash trading filter on as well. But the volume quote was quite low, like 200, um, around 400. And then if you look at it even nowadays, like just from the bar chart, it doesn't look like huge growth, but now they're doing like, now you're doing like 7,000 ETH volume. Um, and it's been a huge kind of climb up since May. Compared um, to what? So if you look at that March, let, let's just look at that peak volume that we had in March. How much was this? <laughs> 1,100. Okay. And then, yeah. and then the peak, are those last two over there still April? The, in the month of April, These if months? you go further. Sorry, no, oh, sorry. further to the right back in April. Are those last two big ones still in April or is it May already? Uh, coming into May. April coming and into May. May. Yeah. Okay, fine. So we, we had a, a bit of a, of a rise. But um, I mean, look, it's, yes, as you say, it's, it's, been a, it's been a rise. It's been a journey. The mm. way, the thing is, you know, rightly or wrongly, the way the, way the platform has, has decided to grow was organically. So it, it didn't go and try to do a, a lot of huge big marketing with influencers and you know get, getting people to pay to, to basically use the platform it's been about developing a good tool with good value good uh, functionality which we believe people would then realize and then obviously use it because the market is a rational market um, having said this as obviously we realized the the open sea monopoly is huge Luxray had just come out, so as a result, they were the you know they were the hot girl in the room, effectively, where everybody was there looking at looking at Luxray, and then we just came out on a month later. So, even though our functionality was very good, and we had already released some, we had released the bulk listing, we had even released a Chrome extension for OpenSea, which allowed people to add to their cart both items from OpenSea and items from X to Y two, so you could browse the two very easily, very seamlessly. It's very difficult to convert new users, um, even though your, your your platform is better. So obviously, we had to do some sort of aggressive type of marketing in a different way, where we said, "Look, I was there at the time, um, at the very beginning of the project, and the rationale was we've got better tools." And I said, "Look, if we have indeed better tools, why don't we just suppress the fees for a month, try to actually collect users, because effectively we need to get people used to using the platform." get people on the platform, see how they like it. And if indeed our tools are better than the competition, then later down the road, people will stay, right? So that's that's sort of the, the strategy that we implemented. And finally, when you go from low fees to zero fees, people started using it. So when it was, it was 0% in April, people started using it. Then we just raised them to 0.5% in May. And, and we saw what we were hoping would happen, which is, a lot of people stayed and not only did they stay, but then they brought people over with them because indeed 
A, they were saving money, but B, the, the UI and UX experience was, was a better one that they had seen before. And as a result, it just made sense for them to keep using the platform. So that's effectively how we've grown so far. And that's how you've seen the rise of users over the past few months. Mm -hmm. If you even have a look at like X2Y2 compared to others, uh, you can see that X2Y2 even in recent weeks has been doing like close to twice, or well, let's say like, what is that, 80% extra uh, compared to looks rare. So actually you've been quite dominant in terms of not, not obviously OpenSea is the leading one, but if you then look at the secondary like mar marketplace after that, X2Y2 mm -hmm. has been that one for quite a few weeks now. Um, so how has it been working at X2Y2 and now seeing this kind of pickup? Has it been, does it actually get crazier for you when these things happen or is the workload the, the same? <laughs> I mean, look, it's uh, obviously it is great to all of a sudden be able to say it's great to go from barely scratching a thousand users a day yeah. to we, we've been having some numbers. We, we almost broke the 8,000 mark uh, on, on a couple of days where we had 7.9 thousand users. And, and what was it? I was telling you, I've got some numbers. So in June, we averaged 4,500 users daily, you know, um, daily active users, like uh, separate users, not, not repeat users. So it's been, it's been good. And then overall, so the max was 7.9 thousand. Total, during the month of June, we had a, a, you know, an accumulation of 135,000 users. Um, obviously, a lot of them are repeat users, but it, it's it's been a riot, as you say. H how has it been? Well, look, there is obviously a great sense of satisfaction to be able to say we are the number two platform, uh, the number two NFT marketplace behind OpenSea. Um, the the goal, you know, very honestly, was always to to eat in a little bit of market share from OpenSea. See first of all if there was demand, if there was uh, demand for it. And, and if there is, then to establish and see how can we build a tool that really responds to all the various market participants' needs. You know, it is one thing to create a platform for traders, but you don't only have the traders out there. You have the buyers and the sellers, right? You need to satisfy both. You have the collection creators, which obviously without them, there wouldn't be anything to buy and sell. So we need to start thinking about how to create a platform that also satisfies their needs. Then you have the NFT, the analytical tools, just like you guys. You have other small analytical tools for which we uh, want to work with as well. So that's really what we've been trying to do, trying to work with the market, work with the participants to try and build the best platform possible. So how has it been? It's been, it's been great from that perspective because we have seen some growth and it has been super hectic. So I officially sort of joined as head of BD beginning of May, I think, end of April, end of April, beginning of May. And... It's just, I was thinking that with the bear market, it would potentially slow down, but it's been the opposite um, because there is more time for people to start thinking about building. As a result, we've been having many more people that have reached out to us and say, hey, can we do something together? Can we work together? I've been focusing on doing a lot of AMAs with the existing collections and new collections to sort of obviously keep, keep in touch with the market, see what people are saying, see what people need. Um, just the other night, um, well, our time, UK time, I was uh, w having an AMA with Moonrunners, and I was just uh, howling with them, uh, with their community uh, in the middle <laughs> of the night like this, because they're the wolves. So it, it was very cool, I have to say. It's, it's been a very cool yeah. ride. <laughs> well, that is uh, interesting to know. Uh, I wanted to look here. Like, it so stands out out of, like, all the data, the transactions and users. Like, it's crazy growth. Uh, that we've kind of seen over the last couple of months, which obviously you must be really proud of. Um, but again, like you said, just a sign of the market. Things like Moonrunners um, thrive off the kind of low fee marketplaces. Um, and in that, actually, let's have a look at this first, because I thought this stood out. So buys per day, um, as you can see here, like it, despite the market feeling like everything's down only at the moment, buys per day, uh, for the NFT market in general, uh, but also especially for X2Y2, has seen quite a sharp increase, um, especially since this drop-off. So this was when uh, all the mania was happening. So FreeAC got liquidated and all of this, this big drop-off happened. You can see it in the Bitcoin price as well. Uh, it's just kind of correlates to this. But since then, we've had this big like run-up, um, especially for X2Y2. And that's like quite crazy growth. And I think like you just said, you probably didn't expect it. 
I was quite bearish on the market before like the kind of crash that we saw. But I was, I have to say, very bearish on NFTs. And I think they've surprised me um, in terms of ETH value anyway. Because I think I was thinking NFTs are the highest risk asset, really, more than crypto. So maybe they'll suffer the most. But in reality, I think people have just kind of funneled the money they did have <laughs> into NFTs. So it's yeah. whatever they've got left. And I think it's just the fun side of it. Like when everything is so doom and gloom, I guess. Maybe I underestimated like how much fun NFTs can be um, in these situations. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I, I, you know, I think you raise a very good point there. Um, I used to think, while well, I used to hear, you know, listening to news podcasts, that NFTs are effectively a risk on asset from a risk on asset class, right? So effectively, it's a double, it's a compounded risk on asset class because it's it's part of crypto and then it's on top of crypto. Um, but you do raise a very good point, which is during a bear market. And actually, I was talking with a with a game uh, provider at the time, and I said, you know, bear markets are actually probably the best time to launch games because what do people do during bear markets? Well, they actually tend to stay at home a little bit more and play more games and have more fun with, as you say, the money that they currently have. So NFTs, you, you were talking about, you know, I guess the future of NFTs in a way. I think NFTs are here to stay and they're going to be here for a long time and they, they, they're not going anywhere because NFTs, not only are they fun, but they really touch on an emotional aspect of or an emotional side of people's brain. Crypto, crypto is just pure money. Effectively, it's just trading money. But NFTs, it's about trading, but while trading something very cool, very fun and you know, something potentially very artistic at the same time. So it really fulfills many different aspects, uh, other aspects that we don't have anywhere else effectively. And, and as you rightly say, people are probably now looking at it and be like, okay, I've got this pot of money. Realistically, that pot of money is gone because uh, of the market. So might as well just go have fun with it, do some degen plays, do some smart plays on the side and just see how it goes. Um, and I totally agree with you. I think this is part of what is, what is happening. I think as well, like with NFTs, uh, I think it was Alex, our CEO, who said it to me, especially. Um, they're like, when you trade crypto, especially in a bear market, if you lose your money and it goes down, you, you're left with nothing. You're left with a like balance that's gone down. If you yeah. own an NFT that goes down, you're at least left, hopefully, with something that's nice looking. <laughs> I mean, look at you it. You've got the painting right behind you. You've got the pudgy right behind you, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you end up with something that you can actually hold and you still like. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. So maybe that's also why people feel like they can take a bit of risk on it because they're kind of happy to go. Maybe, hopefully they don't want to go to zero, but if it goes down, they're still holding something they like. And also I think NFTs have that power that crypto doesn't, of course, where crypto is monetary, like you said, so you're, you're there for financial gain. Um, but with NFTs, at least if you lose value, you can then utilize the NFT one in terms of like how it looks, but if you are trying to get into Web3 uh, to work here, or you're just trying to build a profile for whatever reason, you just want to have fun. Uh, they have a lot of power behind them, especially the well-known collections. Um, yeah, sure. Like obviously I'm biased for penguins, but penguins in like that price range of like one ETH, it's not a big cost. And then you can kind of build up uh, who you are uh, with it. So there's a risk of like losing all your money, but if you lose all your money, at least you own a nice penguin or whatever, and then you can build up your uh, profile and you can put it on your <laughs> wall and you can get a t-shirt like me. But you know, effectively, when people were talking about NFTs, what are NFTs? What are what are they? There's they're just silly JPEGs. Well, no, but it, it's been you know, it's been classified. It is indeed considered as digital art, right? So from a certain perspective. All of us, I mean, I don't know, have you ever been involved in physical art? It's it's a crazy market. I mean, the jump to get into physical art, the price range is, is massive. So all of us that are trading NFTs, effectively, we are digital art dealers, effectively. So th there is some sort of aspect to this. Um, one of the things you were talking about earlier, which um, you know, rang a bell where you were saying crypto, there's so much to look at to understand the potential ups and downs of crypto you have i mean you've got to understand the macro factors and on top of this you've got all the other factors related to crypto itself to the coin that you will look at um which which requires a hell of a lot of research now 
from an NFT perspective, I didn't use to think so, but now that we're talking about this, if you wanted to understand the inner workings of a given collection, it is, yes, it is still research, but it, it is a lot less research. And it's, uh, you know, it's, re it's accessible research that anyone like you and me could do. So effectively, if you really wanted to dig into a collection, you could really understand it and then trade in and out of it. So from that perspective, especially now with tools like what you guys are providing and what exists out there, there really is a way still to understand what to do for a given collection and still make money effectively. Mm -hmm. I think in just like a wider sense, um, I know everyone's like here or a lot of people are here for like their money and there are people that just enjoy the art and I've always really liked art I have to say um, and I've always thought at the start I was like this is so dumb with NFTs but then the more you think about it like it makes so much sense to me in terms of like if you want to one if you're an artist and you want to sell your art where is your liquidity coming from you're gonna have to like find some gallery or something some physical gallery go there, try and sell it. If you don't sell it, you'll have to wait and go to the next one or whatever. There's all this process. Or if you have <clears throat> physical art that's really expensive and you're the buyer, you have to pay that cost of like transport. You have to pay that cost of maintenance. It's all slow moving. You can't show that many people. Like there's, to me, there's so many benefits and, and maybe you've already spoke to them, but if you ever have a conversation with um, 6529, they have that, uh, on Cyber Gallery, I think mm -hmm. it's amazing, and that really like when I was looking at that, it, like clicked on my head how amazing NFTs can be, other than just like monetary, uh, monetary use or gain, um, because they have all these benefits. Like my cousin is an artist, and I, I say to her, you should do this because your liquidity is so much more. There's all these buyers for like sure. globally now for your one piece of art, and that's why the prices get so high because you've got all that demand for the really small supply um so yeah i think the benefits are enormous and i had a conversation with you before like nfts outside of art i think will also be enormous we're just not really at that stage yet uh so yeah where, where do you think yeah. nfts move kind of outside of this as well so you know to touch on what you just said there mm. nfts have already revolutionized the way artists are working and artists are going to work in the future um, as you rightly say, you don't have the transport cost. You don't have the, the, the galleries cost. I mean, obviously, now we have marketplaces instead, NFT marketplaces. But the fees that are being taken from there are so minimal compared to the galleries that it's a huge incentive for the collection creators. I mean, you have people like, um, oh, his name escaped me, Damien Hurst. Damien Hurst now is is into nfts and is doing nfts right you can buy the nft you could redeem that nft for the physical copy i've got a friend who did this and now you have more and more people that are getting into actually fine art through nfts so it really is a revolution it has already happened from that perspective now where is it going to go and where is it going to grow well i mean it's only i think it's only going to keep growing from there i don't know if you saw but uh that's quite a few months back now there was a guy in Miami who opened his house or opened his, his apartment door via his NFT. Obviously, yes, it was overkill. He had to do this whole thing, but he took his phone. Well, I mean, nowadays you can do everything with your phone, right? But he took his phone, validated his NFT on his, on his door, uh, on his handle, and, and boom, it, it just opened his door because obviously it was a token that was verifying ownership of, of the, the apartment. So I think this is where a lot of this is going to go where everything is going to be tokenized effectively. Most of ownership in the world is going to be tokenized. We in the Western civilized world probably don't appreciate and don't really see the need for it because obviously we already have a pretty good system of ownership, but you have a lot of other countries that do not have this. Um, I was speaking with someone who was telling me that um, in, in some countries, two people, could come to uh, a registrar and claim ownership for the same parcel of land. I mean, you know, for us, it seems unfathomable, but NFTs from that perspective would solve so many problems. So I only think it's, it's going to keep growing. Obviously, the next, uh, the next direct applications that we're thinking about is with music, with uh, digital rights, um, with all the movies. There, I was, there's another company that 
I was hearing that he's also doing this with uh, cases of wine and and rare alcohols, right? So you have this. I don't know if you're familiar with the world of you know fine wines, right? But fine wines is an industry where a lot of people are investing in it, and in, they're investing in it not necessarily to buy to to drink the wines themselves, but they are invest making a proper investment because they're thinking of reselling them later on. Because wines, I think year on year, almost a, a cruise. I'm not mistaken. I think I was hearing 10% almost. It's it's pretty consistent. Um, however, the problem with wines is that the really fine wines, the really rare wines, they have to be kept in a very specific temperature. They have to be kept in very specific requirements so that the wine doesn't degrade over the years. So that obviously leads a problem because if you buy a really rare wine, then you would I would have to rely on you storing it in the right conditions. So there's a company now that does this and effectively they are issuing ownership for their wines as NFTs because it solves so many problems in terms of paperwork and things like this. So it, the applications are we're already seeing the difference, um, you know, the emergence and the expansion of NFTs and it's only going to grow from here. Mm. Uh, when I was at university, so I did a law degree. Uh, I remember at the time that was like when I was getting into crypto uh, and I did property law as like a module uh, and it, we always had to like look at like the land registry like you just mentioned and I remember even at the time like even because you're from the UK as well the UK land registry is like a complete mess um, which it shouldn't be because <laughs> we're like yeah. an advanced economy. and I remember yeah. looking at it at the time and thinking like this is perfect situation for like having nfts involved and also having like smart contracts involved so you don't have to keep updating things via people it should be all just kind of done via code and also all transparent on like a blockchain rather than having all these like stupid documents that our government has and whatever um, so i think there's endless kind of future uses that we'll be seeing i think we've got art at the moment because it's probably just like the most fun uh, accessible one to easily understand what's going on uh, but I completely agree. And I think marketplaces like you probably will develop as well um, to kind of grow alongside that. And I, I want to ask you about that, but somehow we've only got 10 minutes left. Uh, okay. So <laughs> let's have a look uh, firstly. Uh, like these kind of, so if you go on to Nansen Trends and Indexes, you can have a look at the top purchases in the last 24 hours. So you can see already on X2Y2 today, someone's bought a Fidenza. Uh, Fidenza. And I often see, yeah, I often see uh, most people buying like large purchases on X2Y2 as well. Because I think you mentioned it earlier. It's like, why wouldn't you? You then get a reward back um, and things like this. So it's not only the kind of free mints that maybe people associate the platform with, Um a lot of the big purchases are also made on X2Y2. Uh, and I would guess it's kind of through Gem um, as well. So I thought that was one really interesting thing to bring up. Um, and I think while we're on that topic, let's have a quick look at your NFT. Have I still got it up? I can't see here. Oh, the agent. Uh, the one. Yeah, let's ask about your NFT because I'm sure some people would like to know what's going on. So yeah, can you explain? Yeah. So the, the way um, the way the project was was funded was effectively through an ILO, right? So it was bootstrapped from that perspective. And then one of the things that we said to ILO participants is that you will basically be rewarded with our own NFT because we are launching our own NFT co collection. So this is what it is. It's called um, Asian Youth Rebel or AYOR. And um, effectively, it's our own sort of PFP. Uh, collection, but the idea is obviously because it is an X to Y two NFT collection, is to also release some utility associated with the NFTs. So we already started where the first thousand were issued to those ILO participants, and if you did own any of those one uh, those first thousand, you would get sort of extra bonus points. For, or extra rewards whenever you making uh, you making trades. So that's one of the very basic and you know easy things that we did to start with. But the goal and the plan is to have all sorts of other utilities associated with owning one of our own NFT collections. Effectively, you know, you're thinking probably whitelist in the future, whatever else, access to tools and things like this. Mm, yeah, I thought it was really cool, uh, and I was actually tempted because I came on here earlier to just kind of look at X2Y to see what you're doing, obviously. Um, and I didn't realize it was minting soon. So do you know a date on that? Or you're not allowed to tell us that? 
we don't yet have a date. Um, obviously, the thing is that with the market conditions, it's probably, you know, we're not in a rush to do it. But and to, there are so many collections right now that unfortunately are not minting out. So mm -hmm. to be honest, we have so much work to do on all the other developments and UIs mm -hmm. that I don't think we're going to mint any time during the bear market. Um, but as soon as we have a date, we'll make sure to communicate to everyone. Because mm. I thought this was really cool. It's like if you hold it, uh, you're basically like entered into raffles. Then, um, uh, well, not earn, possibly win uh, one of the popular NFTs. I really like that. And what I did really like is like the art is actually good because <laughs> I know it maybe is like tempting to launch your own NFT and not have much effort going into it. But I actually think they look really good regardless. Um, so so I would... Our dev team is is in Japan, and obviously a lot of the mm. art that we see nowadays. I mean, look at yeah. Azuki. The, you know, the the Japanese and the Asian artists are incredible. It's just uh, the way they're drawing things over there is just amazing. So obviously, we have access to very good artists uh, while our our team is over there, and I think this is what you're seeing there. So I'm glad glad you like it. I do have to say, the first time I saw it, I was like, same reaction. I was like, oh, nice. This is actually quite good compared to some of the other stuff that we see. And I'm like, ah, yeah. it's like it looks so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it actually looks good. And uh, I really like the kind of features um, as well. And I thought we've only got like five minutes left. If anyone's got any questions, uh, put them in the chat. I'll answer them. Or uh, Wacky can answer them as well, obviously. Um, I thought, while we've got five minutes, I will do an outro. But because we've done like a whole, uh, someone says X2, Y2 is amazing. They love it. So that's good for you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> um, you. <laughs> that's great. We're on like theme of NFTs. I'm just going to show you quickly what Nansen has for NFTs. And again, if you want to try it, Nansen, we have a light sign up uh, link in our bio and a trial sign up as well in our bio. So we have all this data on NFT paradise. So, oh, we did want to get onto Mint Master. We've run out of time. But so you have all of this overview of what's going on, volume floor, all this amazing stuff, the most profitable people. I did a tweet recently that these three people are the same person. <laughs> uh, so if you want to check that out, yeah, that's very interesting. Wow. Um, I'm just going to point one more thing. We do also have a Mint Master section. Um, and recently, if you have a look at this page here and it shows you the most recent reveals um, of NFTs. And we then rank pretty much as soon as the reveal happens, all of the NFTs in terms of rarity, which I think is a really, really good tool. Um, and I know people that used to kind of pay for like bots and stuff like this just to get this one feature, because then you can show that like the reveal happens, rarity tools and like rarity sniper usually don't have it up for a while. We have them up kind of instantly, so you could kind of pick up the rares um, as soon as they come out. So I think that's quite a good feature, so I thought I'd highlight that. Um, what, oh, someone asked, Casper asks, who I know actually, uh, what are the ideas of the utility for your NFT? So we did have a quick look at it, didn't we? Maybe I can just show you that. Yeah, I mean, I think we haven't, to be very, very uh, honest, we haven't yeah. fully developed all of them yet, but the, one of the main ideas will be obviously access to whitelist. Um, we will, we are looking to partner with uh, analytics tools. So it would be access mm. to those analytical tools, those NFT analytical tools. If you guys want to give access, you know, to yeah. the agent PFP, then we can do something. So mm -hmm. that will be one of the main, the most obvious ones. And then we are looking... One of the main things with X2Y2, we're really looking to establish quite a lot of different relationships with different partners. And that's really what we're working on to really make sure that we're not just a simple marketplace, but that we are really all, effectively, we are all part of the same ecosystem. So the more we all work together and help each other, the more we will be able to grow the NFT space. And that's really what we're spending time on. And that's what we're working on. So we're constantly establishing new relationships with new partners. And then the, the NFT holders would benefit from those relationships. Yeah, definitely. I think we'd really be interested in that. So let us know about that. And in that okay. same theme, um, because we've obviously spoken on our podcast on YouTube, on our channel, uh, we did have a conversation briefly earlier that like, I'd be happy or someone on our team would be happy to kind of do an AMA in the X2Y2 Discord maybe or whatever platform. That'd be great, really yeah. 
yeah, because we'd love to showcase our data in relation to X2, Y2, because didn't get around to all of it at the moment, uh, showed some parts. Someone asked, you've got a one minute answer. <laughs> what do you think about Uniswap's uh, takeover of Genie? If you could summarize what your opinion. I think it's in the natural order of things. You know, I think we're going to see more and more consolidation over time, um, where again, the big players are going to acquire some of the small players. And I think if anything, it's probably a good thing because now all of a sudden, and we're seeing it with Gem and OpenSea, where Gem is able to leverage the resources, the OpenSea resources. And I think it will be the same with Genie. Genie will be able to leverage this. And, and then they, it will only make Genie a better tool. Now, as long as obviously there isn't any manipulation around it, then I think I think it's just in the natural order of things, and we're going to see more and more of this. I think in the space. Yeah, definitely. I think you can't really fight these things, and Uniswap yeah, exactly. to me seems a good company. Um, so hopefully, it shouldn't be any kind of shady stuff going on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so thank you so so much, everyone, for listening. Uh, oh wait, someone quickly mentions: Will the trading fee change in the future? I don't know if you can answer that. Uh, probably. Well, to be honest, I don't know yet. Um, I will tell you this. While we are in the bear market, um, you know, our goal as a platform is to help promote the growth of the NFT space. Um, I don't know exactly what we're going to do with fees, when, how we're going to raise them. Um, we would like to make sure before raising the fees, we want to make sure that the NFT space is healthy and growing. So our main priority is to help the NFT space grow. So I don't know. We probably will raise them inevitably at some point, but I don't know when or, or how. Mm. What, while they are low, just benefit from it while they are low. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> okay, so thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Wacky, for coming on. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and nice to hear from a marketplace. We don't really get that too often. Nice to hear from someone from England. I think you might be <laughs> the only <laughs> non nansen English guest we've had. So, yeah. Uh, everyone, My if you want to... Yeah, go ahead. Now I was about to say my pleasure. You know, thanks for having me. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, well, if everyone wants to watch future videos like this, we'll have on some really good guests in the future as well. And might be dropping a different series, which is kind of an alpha leak. Um, mm. I'm not going to tell you more about that. Uh, but it should be exciting. I'm trying to sort it out at the moment. So make sure you subscribe uh, to Nansen for that. And yes, everyone have a really good day. We have Nansen Light sign up in the bio. Uh, and Matson trial sign up in the bio as well. Uh, yes. Okay. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so much, Wacky. And bye bye. Amazing. Thank you very much. Bye bye.